climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century, and it's a message that one of the most prestigious journals, The Lancet, has told us for a long time, too. So this year, The Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change really focused on the health of a child born today, so really making the point that in order to protect these kids that we love, we need to both mitigate uh, climate change, so decrease greenhouse gas emissions urgently, and we also need to work really hard to increase our adaptation, so make sure our hospitals are able to cope with wildfire smoke so it doesn't end up in our operating rooms, make sure that we're flood proofing all of our healthcare facilities. So it was really a call to action for us to take care of the next generation. And, and so seeing multiple you know, nation states declare climate emergencies and as an eMERGE doc, we feel like we need to take really uh, direct action on those things as well. well I live in the subarctic, so some of my patient population is already dealing with temperatures three degrees Celsius than when the, warmer than when they were born. So if you can imagine if you were an elder in Tuktoyuktuk, when you were born, um, the world looked one way and now the world looks a very different way. And so houses up there are sliding into the ocean. Uh, they're not able to do the traditional hunting that has consequences for food security and mental health. So there, there's a lot that needs doing in terms of adaptation depending on where you live. But we know we've only got this really short time window left um, where we can get ourselves onto this low emissions pathway that will keep us to a place where we can adapt to. And so as an eMERGE doc, we tend to be really triggered by time windows. You know, we get a certain amount of time to put in the uh, clot busting drug if someone comes in with a heart attack or, you know, a certain amount of time to hang the anti antibiotics if someone has a really bad infection. So I'm quite, quite motivated on the mitigation perspective. Mm -hmm. What about um, stress that comes with this? I feel like I talk with some people that might feel helpless and, um, you know, like they, they, they've done all they can do and, and there's nothing they can do. And so they're just like, why do I even try anymore? You know, what would you say to that? Well, I think for a long time, we all had this feeling that it was up to us to solve this by ourselves, changes that we were making in our individual lives. And I think what we're now realizing is that within the system that we've built, it's really not possible for any of us to change enough. And so what that means is that we need to come together to change the system. And the good part about that is this, this feeling of eco-anxiety or, or ecological distress that we know is getting worse for people just by the amount of attention and how people are feeling when we're talking to them one of the best things to start to treat it with is with talking to one another. So I talk to a lot of people who feel really lonely with those emotions, but what we know is that when you come together and you share, it's like so many other places, you know, if you're, if you're worried for an exam and you come and you talk about it with your friends, you're going to feel better. And so similar things are seen with eco-anxiety. And so the first thing we do is we come together, we don't feel lonely anymore, there's nothing and we're feeling lonely and anxious about the, the climate. Um, and so that is also the start of the relationships that we need to tackle the problem in a way based on group work that will actually help us change the system enough that we can live our own lives within that system in a way that's consistent with a healthy planet for our kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, cool. So uh, I know that um, New York State, where we are, I'm in Rochester, New York, where, you know, yeah. there. Cuomo, our governor, has done a pretty decent job at kind of pushing toward, uh, you know, renewable goals. But you know, yep. sometimes it can feel like, you know, only only a few states are are making the move. But it kind of has to, be, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, if we really want to get stuff done, it has to come down from the federal level. Is that, you know, is have you heard that mindset as well? Well, it's certainly easier if everybody at all levels are pulling in the same direction, but really when you think about it, it's so much easier to make change when you have a relationship with people. You know, it's easier to change things in your family than it is to change things in your city. It's easier to change things in your city than it is at your state. So in fact, we can make a lot of really tangible change um, at the community and the state level. And that actually starts to provide examples of what works and stories of what works that can start to work at the federal level. So, you know, it's much easier if, if, if everybody's working along the same path in the same direction, but a lot of change right now is happening at the city and the state level. And, and that, you know, makes people feel good. That's something the literature shows us too is that when people take action as a group and they have you know, something that feels like a win, that's, a, that's something that makes you feel good and makes you more motivated to take on a next bigger project. So in a way, taking on sort of bite-sized projects that allow you to have a win is a great way to build momentum and to, to build that feeling of solidarity within your group that makes you feel good and decrease people's feelings of equal anxiety. 
Uh, cool. What are some of the what are some of your goals that you have uh, on this trip to London? Well, we're aiming to come out of here. We've done a giant global brainstorming process, and so we've got you know a huge spreadsheet with ideas that people had for taking action. And what we talk about is docs is start the things that have benefits for people immediately. So. If you take action on transport, that will decrease people's uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with uh, their cars, and that actually decreases air pollution, which therefore decreases things like asthma exacerbation. So the kids feel better right away. We have less visits to the emergency department. If you do that partly by you know biking and getting to where you want to go underground steam, you're going to decrease chronic disease. So we like to start with things like that, where there's win-wins for health right now and for the planet. So we've got you know. A transport rated options. We've got a list of uh, cool things that is probably going to be a pretty big one because most countries in the world, if they're born, burning coal plants, including the U.S., are seeing thousands of deaths every year from air pollution related to, to burning coal. So if we burn, you know, if we decrease that, we switch to a renewable grid, which is getting easier and easier as renewables are getting cheaper. Um, you know, again, we'll keep our kids out of the emergency department so that they can go to school and learn what we need to, them to learn. And uh, so we've got a big list. We've already, we're in the middle of a survey, so people are choosing, they're prioritizing, and so we'll basically come in tomorrow, and people are gonna start pitching their top ideas, and we're aiming to come out of here after two days of workshopping with a really, you know, focused list of, of priority, so that when we take action and we move together as a global uh, health community, um, you know, we really send the message that this is a health emergency. Uh, the world's urgent care medics and health professionals are taking really direct, focused action. And we can see some results and send a signal to, to policymakers and to our patients that we're, we're our best to help take care of our patients and the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about the health angle because so many people think, we got to lower the temperatures, we got to reduce our carbon emissions, we got to lower the number of CO2, acidity in oceans, but you're coming at it strictly from, look, people are dying from pollution, let's fix that problem first, kind of? Yes, when you think about it, that's what we all care about the most, right? We care about our family and if they're well. Uh, you know, if anybody gets sick in our family, all of a sudden our day goes from being a good day to a bad day, so we know that health is, is one of people's top priorities. and. Partly because this actually hasn't been in medical curricula. Um, doctors themselves, in many cases, um, when we do surveys, you know, wasn't they weren't taught about the connection between climate change and health. And so because we haven't learned about it ourselves well as a profession, we haven't communicated it well to our patients. But really, you know, if you, if you take a look at the, the potential for, you know, air pollution and trauma, death related to wildfires, for heat-related illness, for increased Lyme disease, for decreasing uh, nutrition throughout the century, you know, the potential that can bring for things like com conflict and, you know, big displacement. This is a really, this is a health emergency. I am here because I believe this is the most urgent thing I can tackle as an emergency doctor. It's funny. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, what about, um, how much do you emphasize nutrition? I feel like that, that can be a big elephant in the room that a lot of people, you know, don't like to talk about how much their diet might not only, one, impact the climate, but also impact their health. Yeah, that's a really good one. And actually, uh, it was the one-year anniversary just last week of a huge report that came out last year called the Eat Lancet Commission, where they took a look at, their first question was, okay, so what's the healthiest diet for people? For people, And then what's the healthiest diet? What can the planet support? And they came to what they call a planetary health diet. So it, essentially, it's a it's a high plant diet, um, well balanced. It can you know you can eat in a lot of different ways, but it is a reduction in meat for most of us um, in the, the more developed you know high income world. And so that's actually we have a whole list of potential action items around that on my spreadsheet that people are voting on right now. And so I, I think definitely we will have some action items around that. You know, seeing if we can get. A planetary health diet into hospital menus, uh, seeing if we can lead by example as medics, seeing if we can sign on to do commitments around a planetary health diet. So that, that is definitely part of the solution, a huge part. You want to talk about uh, the Australian wildfires a little bit? I'm sure that that's probably a pretty big topic. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's devastating. Um, I, I've done wildfire research in northern Canada, and at that point we were one of 
So in 2014, where I live in Yellowknife, and which is you know high up in the part of Canada that doesn't have a lot of people in it, uh, we had about 250 wildfires ringing my little town of Yellowknife uh, over the course of one summer. So the smoke lasted for about two and a half months. There were there was the occasional day when the wind blew in just the right direction and it came between the fires, and then we had an okay day in terms of air quality. But most days it was horrible. And so what we found was that the public health advice had been designed for much shorter wildfire durations. And so when they're telling you to stay inside with the windows closed because of poor air quality, that works okay when you're doing it for a couple of days, but um, doesn't work very well when when you're talking about weeks or months. And so what we found, um, we looked at asthma rates and we also did about 30 in-depth interviews with people who just experienced the summer and when we analyzed the interviews we found real themes of isolation so people got huge cabin fever they got really lonely inside they didn't get the exercise they usually get outside so there was a you know an irritation associated with that they didn't get the treatment benefit that they usually got from the exercise in terms of high blood pressure diabetes or, or anxiety and depression and it also served as a real sentinel event for them in terms of their understanding of climate change and what it could mean to them and their families. So we had a lot of responses in the survey that said, you know, is this the new normal? If, if it's this bad now, we know it's going to get warmer. Uh, what does this mean for our kids? And so we had just finished that study in terms of qualitative uh, events and we're publishing the quantitative now, but now we've got this in Australia where huge cities are being exposed to these really long uh, smoke episodes and we're having you know high mortality rate uh, direct trauma people you know dying of burns and, and loss of property so it's really a uh, project I'm working for is actually run out of Australia so I've been in pretty good contact with emergency physicians there and it's it's been really devastating for they lost a surgeon uh, who actually had been working as a volunteer firefighter and he and his father were burned on their way home. Mm. So it's really been an event there uh, that has been extremely difficult, as we know, for, for the whole country and also the medical community. And so, you know, of course, there will be many studies coming out of it. But, you know, based on the study we did in Yellowknife, we would anticipate that this also for them would be a, an event that makes them you know, number one, realize the need to adapt. There were studies of, of hospitals, uh, operating rooms, and delivery suites full of smoke. So babies being born into really smoky delivery suites and the moms asking, what does this mean for my baby? And the doctors aren't able to say because actually we don't have studies that show us what the long-term health impacts of these really acute, severe smoke episodes are on children. So it's a whole set of studies that need to be done that I'm sure they'll conduct in Australia now. But, you know, it means we need to really up the uh, type of um, air filtration systems we have in our uh, hospital rooms. I've spoken with public health professionals there who are now experiencing what we experienced in Yellowknife, where they've been, everybody's been staying inside for so many days because of the smoke that they're starting to get really irritable. And one of them even posted a picture of her kid on a trampoline wearing a very intense smoke mask because the kids are going swirly inside. And so, you know, what we did in Yellowknife eventually was our mayor actually um, made all of the indoor recreation facilities free. And so people were able to go and they, we had quite good air filtration systems on a couple of big facilities. And so they were able to leave their house and go and go for a run and, you know, see their neighbors. And it kind of helped us get through that episode. So as we're going to, you know, as we end up with these more severe long episodes, it would be good if we talk to one another and we, you know, come up with solutions like that and then create new sort of lists of best practice ways of getting populations through these big, these big uh, smoke and fire episodes because we know they're coming. And so if we prepare for them, at least we'll be able to get through them, you know, with, with, with more of a sense of community, with more of a sense of wellness. Mm -hmm. Our transport is better now it's going to be better for health future as we mentioned a more plant-rich diet really decreases the greenhouse gas emissions as well as actually preserving a lot of biodiversity so you know you don't then need to cut down the forest in order to have more space to you know have more livestock and so you get to have more forest which means more orangutans means more birds and we know that that's a really important thing for us to be taking care of right now too and what i really do think is super important is for people to know that it's normal if you're feeling worried about climate change right now it's totally normal that is a normal reaction 
and, and what we feel better if, if we start talking to one another about it, sharing those emotions, and then taking these uh, action items, fighting off sort of chunks that are just the right size for the team that we've got, skill sets that we've got, making progress because that feels really good. So it feels good, we build community, and we start to keep the planet healthier for our kids and 